You created this character, Kumare, went to Arizona, and you founded, I guess you could call it, a religious movement or a cult. You either have to be what I was, was complete empty. Like, I knew I was a fraud, but if you actually were, like, struggling with the fact that, like, whether you might be real, you'd have to convince yourself that you had all the answers. I mean, I've seen this in multiple books that I've written where we follow a guru and they become cynical. They start fucking their students or there's, you know, extreme financial domination of subjects. So I had come up with this sort of thing where I, I held somebody against my forehead, forehead to forehead or third eyes touching, and I would shoot energy into their skull through my skull. I did it with this one girl and um, she just said, everything you said just touched me so deeply and I just thought, I'll follow you anywhere. And I actually went to the Osho ashram in Pune and got invited to an orgy. And I was like, oh my God, this is a crazy thing that's going on here. And it's a, it's a fascinating thing. People got an authentic spiritual or developmental experience from a complete fraud. Perhaps every religion is based on these ideas that we, we create and they're not based on anything authentic and that's okay. Do you consider yourself as a fraud when you were doing that or is your experience like, no, maybe I wasn't a fraud even though I thought I was a fraud? The West has this fascination with Eastern spirituality. In America, we look to India and China as a haven for lost esoteric knowledge. We think of meditating monks and saffron robed gurus as an antidote to Western NOMI where we see the failings of our overworked, grinding culture, the scandals in our own religious institutions, and the brutal violence of our military-industrial complex, some of us look to the Himalayas as the last bastion of wonder, of purity even. A place where magic might really exist. And an alternative, you could say, to even the Christian conception of heaven is a new term, enlightenment. This idea that, that just having knowledge could give you almost supernatural powers over the world, over the material reality that we live in. This idea of enlightenment permeates Hollywood culture. Um, the Ewoks, they spoke in high-speed Tibetan. Neo in The Matrix, he was modeled on this Buddhist idea of an illusionary world called samsara. If you've ever watched Batman Begins, he learned martial arts from a Himalayan master uh, after finding a secret blue lotus in a snowfield. Meanwhile, Eddie Murphy rescued an enlightened teenager in the movie The Golden Child. We have this thing about the East in the West where we cast our fantasies towards something greater than ourself. And those people the, in India and in China have their own relationship with these ideas, these ancient traditions. And many of these people have made their way to the United States. We have um, Satya Sai Baba and Osho with his community in Oregon where he where not only did he ha form something like a sex cult, you could say, he also poisoned the school board and, and, and people almost died. And then he, when he actually did die, he blamed the CIA for killing him. There's Sadhguru. He is the, the most recent guru in orange robes for the world to, to fall in love with. And then there's my, you know, my uncle. I don't know if you knew this, but my uncle was one of the people who traveled with the Beatles in North India and first met the Maharishi and then founded Transcendental Meditation in the United States. He wears a crown on the stage. His name is, is uh, Keith, I think it's Keith, Keith Wallace is his name. I have been steeped in these ideas for a long, long time. And the reason why you're listening to this podcast, watching this video right now is because I have this guest here today who has been on a parallel journey for, I believe, his whole life. We're going to find out if it was really his whole life. But he did this 
I think it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. I'm going to put it at that level. It's called Kumare. And what it is, this, the, my guess is Vikram Gandhi. He's a filmmaker. He's done many, many films, including about Obama and the drug war, about race, about transgender issues. He was a correspondent, uh, Vice, when Vice had correspondence. <laughs> and, and, uh, but the thing that, the reason that Kumari was such an amazing film was that unlike these other documentaries that go in to sort of expose the cult by finding the cult leader and then going in there and, and sort of seeing all their bullshit. It started out with the bullshit because Vikram Gandhi is or was Kumare. He, you know, is an Indian guy, you know, or, or at least Vikram, you're not Indian, right? You're, you're, you're American. You're from, your parents are from Punjab, right? Yeah. I was, I was born in New York. So he yeah. is a, a, a from America, but he realized that that there's this exotification of of e the East, and he, well, you dressed, you created this character Kumare, went to Arizona, and you founded, I guess you could call it a religious movement or a cult, and the documentary sort of follows that you, I mean, you're sort of like Borat in this case, right? You're 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 you're, you're being that character every single day. And people actually really did follow you. We're going to start this conversation talking about that journey for you and where it's taken you to today. So thank you so much for being here on my podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. Kumari, what do you, why did you come up with the idea of Kumari? Um, I grew up in, I did, I was born in, in New York and my father um, started a temple in our basement when we lived in New Jersey, when I was probably like five years old, there's a little newspaper article that says Hindus plant seeds in Jersey. And uh, <clears throat> it was a picture of our family because we started a Hindu temple in our basement and um, it, my father his father had started a temple when he, his, my grandfather migrated to, to Burma and my father, when he moved to America, um, wanted to carry that tradition. Um, and because of that, I was around, um, spiritual people, Hindu, uh, religious Hindus. And, um, it also made my parents, you know, as much as they were carrying on some traditions from India, they were also very much connecting with all of the different movements that had to do with Hinduism in America. And so I got a lot of it. You know, I learned a lot of um, Vedic mantras. I learned, you know, I was reading Sanskrit and reading these mantras and, you know, barely understanding what they meant. Um, and I was surround a lot of ritual and learned a lot of philosophy at a very young age, you know, almost like the same time you're just like, learning how the world works it's the same time you know as a child as i'm learning math and science you know at a very young age talking like starting like five six seven years old i was learning all this stuff and um so that made me pretty educated in the world of indian spirituality to a degree that um you know most young people didn't have but as much as i absorbed that when i was you know around the age that boys get anxious, you know, annoyed and bored. I also got very skeptical and, and questioning. So when I was a young kid, I, I was the person in that environment that would say like, wait, what are we actually saying? And why is that guy, why is that guy wearing that robe? And why are you listening to him? And mm -hmm. those marshmallows actually have gelatin and that's meat. Why are we eating that? If we're not vegetarian, if we're supposed to be vegetarian, like the, these things that you know, any, any sort of annoying teenager would ask, I, I was that annoying teenager. And mm -hmm. so to be quite honest, um, what Kumari was, was an extension of that kid who had a lot of questions, who felt like all the adults around me were full of shit. And, um, I grew up and saw the same thing in American spirituality in the new age movement. And in the yoga mm -hmm. movement, I saw that same bullshit that I'd seen adults doing, but now as an adult in a world where this was now taking over and becoming the new normal in New York City where I was living. And so 
in a lot of ways, it's that same skeptical voice that I had as a kid. I just tried to find a way to do that as an adult and ask the same questions on a bigger scale. And you also have deep knowledge in it. Like it's very clear when you're, um, you know, presenting Kumare, you, you understand where the traditions are coming from, but also where the holes are in it. And one thing that I find so fascinating about this journey, you know, I was raised uh, atheist, right? I don't have a religious tradition behind me, but it was very normal in my community of friends who did have, you know, Christian backgrounds for people to be so critical of where they came from. You know, you got pedophile you know, scandals, people worried about the crusades, like all the bullshit that Christianity has like accumulated over the years. And yet they can look at another tradition and think, well, they got it figured out, right? And so when you're coming up, you're you're seeing the the, you know, the history of Hinduism is full of contradictions, right? The history of all of those religious movements have real problems in it, but you've, you had this inside knowledge. And then when you, you know, as you say, Hinduism is incredibly fashionable, right? It has been adopted by the wellness industry. It has become sort of a, um, it's like the alternative for anything. Like when, when you're, you're, you're talking about science, right? Some hardcore like COVID stuff, right? If you can't find your scientific language to argue your point, you can just pivot over to wellness language, which is borrowed from sort of some Hindu Swami, which might've been regurgitated 20 times. And then you have a whole new lexicon to deal um, and to, to explain your point. And I think that it, it's, you know, the West probably has, You've been dealing with Eastern thought since about the 1860s, right? That's really when, um, you know, the, the, the first real translations of the Rig Veda and, uh, you know, the Mahabharata and Ramayana really start circulating in the United States anyway, which is more than two generations or three generations out. And yet it still has this exotic appeal to it. You know, why is it that we don't see in the United States that there could be problems in Eastern spirituality. And what is the lens that we, that, that, that is employed here? Well, I think that, I think that it's harder for us to see it just like, it's harder for a person to see what's wrong with them by, you know, why, why we, why we have therapists and use mirrors and all these other things. It's very hard to see the most obvious things that are happening. Um, but it, and it is, but it, it's also easier to see, you know, a con when they resemble you, you know, mm -hmm. when you see, when you see somebody that you're related to, uh, talking like that, they've, you know, if, if you have a friend who decided that they all of a sudden became like a wellness guru, you could see their bullshit immediately. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I know, I know where this is coming from. You're not, you're not the person you claim to be. And I think if, I think what I see that from Indian people trying to navigate a world of Westerners following Eastern teachers, you can really see their bullshit a lot easier. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm hearing, someone might be hearing an Indian person who sounds very exotic because of the way they speak, but I'm, I'm hearing my uncle, right. you know? And, mm -hmm. um, and so I do think, I do think that because of that distance, there's a lot of there is a lot of things that people can project on those teachers. But I also think that one thing that is quite special about, you know, about India also is that, and the, and the reason that Indian religion can be kind of taken and regurgitated and re it's sort of appropriated in all these different ways is because, you know, there isn't really one belief system when it comes to Hinduism. I think that's what the Hindu right in India is trying to sort of throw onto Indian religion. That's what a lot of people who have their own sect or belief, they want everything in India to have been furthering one message. When you look at everything that's been written in Indian history, it's like, are you supposed to be vegetarian? The ancient gods were sacrificing animals. Like what, what is it? Gandhi was reading the Gita which is a story about a warrior going to physical war, yet he interpreted it as nonviolent. It is like a huge library of incredibly interesting texts and things that I appreciate deeply, but not as one monolith and one, you know, one, one way of one way of thinking. It's it's actually about diversity, and yeah. and strangely, um, 
because people want to sort of manipulate all of the texts to sort of further one point, a lot of people can manipulate all of Indian philosophy to say, it's all leading to the way I think. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't do that with Greek philosophy, which I think is pretty much the same sort of similar history, European philosophy. You could look at Greek and Roman literature and think of it as kind of like we're Indian literature, the same sort of tradition. Um, Yeah. So I think that it's a very easy, it's a very chaotic, anarchic set of beliefs, which is what, where it's beauty come from, but it can also be manipulated because of that. Um, It's it's interesting because in in India, there's certainly very big dialogues about in the traditions, right? You have Vaishnavites, you have Shaivites, you have people who follow certain sages, you have different um, uh, traditions that are local to different regions. And it's an incredibly diverse, just like the landscape in Europe with the, you know, Greek Orthodox over here, Russian Orthodox over there, C of E over in England, like all of these, these mixing traditions. And we don't, we from the West, we just paint it all with, like what you're saying, we paint it all with this broad brush and then further whatever point we want. And I, I'm glad that you brought up sort of Hindu fundamentalism in, in India, which is something that most Americans have no clue about, that there's this whole saffron wave that's of basically right-leaning thinking uh, that has been glommed, have, has a certain version of of neutered Hinduism glommed on top of it in, in the same cynical way that uh, evangelical Christianity gloms on to Trump. But, you know, it's, it's also clear that you, you know, it's, it's a complex relationship because you obviously love these thoughts. And I see wisdom in these thoughts. Like <laughs> half of my podcast is dealing with Eastern thought in one way or another, but trying to come at it from the sides The thing that always strikes me when I think about Kumare and when I've talked about your documentary on other episodes of this show was after going in and and presenting yourself as a stereotypical guru, right? And and with you, you're using some yoga. I believe your staff that you're wearing, he's carried the staff. and And I think it says... Um on it, not ohm, if I recall looking at it correctly, remembering it. In- uh, it's just the uh part. Like <laughs> ohm, ohm is kind of a, is a vowel sound. You know, it's, it's a letter. So yeah, it's the uh sound. And, right. Yeah. Right. It's, but it's not ohm, but it's sort of like to a Western looks like, ohm. like it has this sort of like feel to it. And you're, you're sort of making these sort of jokes to the audience who knows something about this, but also playing up that exotification. And then you amass followers. You actually have people who see you as this purveyor of knowledge. And in these, and you, and you, you know, you meet with some people that I wrote about, I wrote this book called The Enlightenment Trap, um, which is about Geisha and Michael Roach and Lama Christy McNally. You interview these folks before they went crazy and people started dying. And how do you, as an actor, directly, director, documentarian, and good person, how do you maintain that sort of duplicity that was that is part of of that that project? Well, I mean, I think that I'm not an actor. You know, like it's actually funny because when I look at that film, I realize, you know, how little training I had. I just it. I think before making that film, I was still one of those people who hated looking at their photograph or hearing their voice on our um, answering machine when we had answering machines. Um, So it was, it was coming from really this core kind of prankster part of me where um, it was the, not a a trained comedian, but a, a joker kind of person in me. Like I, um, as a kid, it was, you know, pretty much surrounded by all these, a lot of swamis. And I also loved imitating my grand grandmother and my grandfather. And, and so the character itself kind of just came to life by me going out and trying it out. Like I tried a bunch of times before I knew I could make the movie. I scheduled a yoga class, made a, we made a website and like scheduled a yoga class in New Jersey, someplace it probably wouldn't, you know, they'd be like, oh, this is interesting. We'll host a guru. Um, and it kind of happened accidentally that um, I used these sort of sessions of trying out the character of Kumare um, a number of times. And there was uh, and one time we filmed it and we filmed it pretty well. 
And in that class, I did a bunch of breathing exercises, sort of Kundalini inspired or adjacent stuff. I had made up chants that were based on like slogans, like just do it and be all you can be translated into Sanskrit. And then <laughs> wait, what's I, be all you can be in Sanskrit? Um, sort of all above. I can't, I can't remember exactly. I have, you know, I actually had like a hundred, maybe like 50 of them translated. Um, <laughs> but the joke was so inside. We never really like put it in the film, but um a couple other things I were trying out were all the sort of things that gurus did. So like exercises, breathing exercises, rituals, you know, uh, spiritual lectures. And the last thing I did was um, inspired by um, the hugging saint, Amma. I, you know, Amma would hug people and give this sort of spiritual Shakti pot, like uh, this transference of energy. And I said, well, what would Kumare's, you know, if he had one, what would his, Shakti Papi. So I had come up with this sort of um, thing where I, I held somebody against my forehead, forehead to forehead, our third eyes touching, um, and I would shoot energy into their you know skull through my skull. Um, and when I say shoot energy through my skull, it, I, I would imagine I would do that and kind of perform it. And um, at the end of one of these classes where I was testing out this thing to see if it worked, um, I would I would do that ritual with people and then they would talk to me for you know a few minutes. And I did it to this I did it with this one girl and I, you know, I, our foreheads touched and I shot whatever energy I thought I had in me. And um she just said, you know, I everything you said just touched me so deeply and I just thought I'll follow you anywhere. And we watched that footage and all of us were like, I think this is a movie. Like I think yeah. this character works. So that's how the character was like started. It was me trying it out to see, is this actually something that works, you know? And it did. Um, so that's how it kind of came to be. As far as staying in character, it's really one of those things where you take a leap in doing something that you're fully unprepared to do, like pretend to be a religious leader for months at a time and gain followers and see where it goes. And you make that commitment, you bring enough people along with you and you just kind of have to do it. So yeah. um, the way I stayed in was that every moment while I stayed in character meant that the movie could be over. Like the whole, we weren't like, it wasn't like Borat in that, or, you know, Bruno or, or some other prank films in that where you, you, you meet somebody and if you blow it, you hope they don't say anything. You can move to the next town and keep shooting the movie and it, it nothing would happen. In our situation, because I went to Arizona and was in Phoenix and was engaging with the, this community of people, had one person found out. Um, yeah, it would all fall apart. Would unravel. Which is a, like truly a monumental acting um, moment for you. But the other thing that about that, which is in, in, in a way more interesting to me, is that there are gurus who are doing this for a living, right? I mean, who, who take on a character, embody a character, and, and they fake it until they make it, which also happens to be the central uh, tenant in like um, Tibetan Tantra in general. Like the Tibetan meditations, and I'm more familiar with Tibetan meditations, I'll bet you the Hindu ones are somewhat similar, but I just, I just don't know them as well. But it's like you pretend to be the god in your meditation and then you become the god in reality. That's the, the idea. And so you envision yourself as a god, then you act more like the god. And 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 that faking it till you make it, which is also like an American business slogan, which is just do it, right? It, there becomes this spiritual connection there. And at the end of the movie, and just like the, the lady that you had just mentioned, you have people who, who, when you do reveal the fact that you are, you've been sort of hoodwinking this group uh, for a, some sort of bigger message. There are people there who are like, no, but I got a spiritual message out of this. I'm sure there are other people who are angry. And what does this, what does that message tell you about the authenticity of spiritual experiences? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really what the whole experiment is about, is to understand what is authentic. And, you know, I think that 
what's funny is that, you know, I made the film and I'm in the film, but strangely, like as time passes, I get, I get different messages back from it. Um, and the re and, and what I was really searching for, because it's actually like such a sort of basic experiment, you know, I just happen to embody it, but like, it's a thought thing, you know, it's a thought experiment that I think anybody who's studied religion or, or philosophy has thought about, like, what is the value of placebo? Can the placebo have the same effect as the authentic thing? Is anything really authentic? That's what this was exploring. And I think, you know, the film, the outcome of it showed that people got an authentic spiritual or developmental experience from a complete fraud, from like everything being made up, you know, right? And, and that means that, um, that the placebo is as strong as the real thing. And that, um, perhaps every religion you could, you could then say, yeah, well, every religion is based on these ideas that we, we create and they're not based on anything authentic and that's okay. And that's what they are. And maybe if we all accepted that, we would actually like move further along in our understanding of spirituality than, than sort of be stuck in trying to figure out what's authentic and what's not. Do you still find, do you find yourself as a, like a, did you get a spiritual lesson out of this? Would you say, I mean, I know that you're saying you, you're, you're, you're touching on this point, but do you, do you consider yourself as a fraud when you were doing that? Or do you, is your experience like, no, maybe I wasn't a fraud, even though I thought I was a fraud. Well, I think that the thing that I, the thing that I believed in, you know, a lot of times when you do these things, it's like, it's a combination of being naive mm -hmm. and, and that naivete mm -hmm. like allows you to be brave in ways that you would be too smart to be later on in life. You know, like later on, you'd be like, I'm too smart to do something that ridiculous. Um, I've gained too much, you know, and I think that's how a lot of things are created by people just being a little too dumb to realize it was, they shouldn't have messed with it. And I think at that age, when I made that film, I was so, I, 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 I was, I had, I had so much a, of a clear understanding of what I believed about the bullshit of, of the spiritual world in America. Like I was so, I, I just was so turned off by everything. I found everybody being, even people I loved and cared about. I was like, we're just, we're all full of shit. So like, mm -hmm. this is the truest thing I can do and express is to show how we're just all full of shit. And, and weirdly that language, you know, brought something kind of beautiful in a way into the film that was really authentic. But I really went in with just, just like, let us, let me just expose how absurd we all are. Not just, not just Americans, you know, trying to sort of appropriate Indian culture, but Indian people as well. Mm -hmm. We're trying to appropriate ancient Indian culture and Hindu right people. Like I was thinking it's all bullshit. And this was, this was the tool. Kumari was the tool for me, which I could, could prove that point. And it, I think it showed other things that were more intellectual and more interesting than maybe I had sought out to do. Um, and I think one of the reasons is when you do the, the second layer to that is like, as an intellectual exercise, Kumari is really interesting in exposing bullshit, but also as a human experience is really about trying to understand what is it actually like to be a religious leader? Mm -hmm. Like, what's it like to be inside of that, uh, inside of that vessel? And it is, um, it is a fucking hard place to be. And you either have to be what I was, was complete empty. Like I knew I was a fraud. So in a weird way I could handle it because I went home and been like, I don't have any answers for these people. But if you actually were like struggling with the fact that like, whether you might be real, you'd have to convince yourself that you had all the answers. Well, that you is can't true. really do it unless you were kind of like a sociopath, you know? Yeah. That is just so fascinating. I mean, I touch on all of these aspects in my channel all the time. And I think that for me, Kumare, when I saw it, 
first, I was writing the Enlightenment Trap and you were asking all of the same questions that I was. And I love the fact that you're like, look, I was blundering through it. Like, and, and I look back at some of my older work and I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't have done that today, right? Like we all have, we all grow older, we all get wiser, I hope. I mean, we change anyway. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, it, it's, I feel like it's one of those films that has a lot of deep spiritual messages in it, a lot of deep intellectual messages, and it peels back the onion. I can totally see why, you know, even while you're making it, you don't even realize what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, when you say that you're, you're going to, you're, you're putting forehead to forehead with this woman and you're going to shoot pranic energy from your third eye into her third eye, like, okay, so you were doing that as, a, as knowing that you're a fraud, but at the same time, you were actually doing it. And there's this, up, like, so, you know, you were actually saying, well, I'm going to try to shoot pranic energy out of my forehead. And you have this other great scene in it where a guy, I think, I mean, it's weird, guys. It's, it's super weird. There's this scene in Kumare where someone takes basically a buffer, like for an automobile, and buffs you, right, in some sort of spiritual buff way. And I think you're in, like, a loincloth. And, and... Uh, and you're both in that moment trying to live that moment as purely as possible. Totally. Actually, yeah, the guy's name is Daryl Hicks. Uh, sometimes he hits me up on Facebook Messenger these days. But he, uh, this incredible lung capacity, he could play all of these like, these like wind instruments really well. And uh, he did this sort of didgeridoo chakra, like balancing sound therapy that also had a car buffer and in the car buffer portion of it, you sort of hyperventilate and he kind of, and he uses a car buffer on you and then he helps you squeeze sort of all the air out of you while you're hyperventilating. And, it, and I remember doing that and I said, I'm just going to go all in, like I'm going to go all in and just get the treatment as deeply as possible. Almost like really submitting to him being having some spiritual power and I remember like when I was, I was um, hyperventilating at, in that moment in the film, like I actually was like going to a completely different psychological place. I was like, this is really, it was really, really intense, uh, probably from lack of oxygen or, you know, some other pretty basic reason. But um, after the film came out, um, you know, the guy said to me, he's like, you know, I don't know who you are really. And I feel weird about what you did, but no one has ever taken my treatment as deeply as you did on that day. And I really appreciated that. And I was like, actually, yeah, I really went into it. I like fully submitted to that guy's treatment. I don't know if it was brilliant, but I, you know, or if it was in my head, but like, it was funny because, because I played that into as a, like, I also faked being the deepest, Mm -hmm. disciple in that scene um and yeah, i gained you were, from it, you were you know? studying the deepest tantra <laughs> is, the, is the funny thing here right it, and and yeah i mean so there's this concept in anthropology so i was you know doing a degree in anthropology for a while before i became a journalist and there's this idea called habitus which i come back to very frequently it's like what body postures? What physical things you, do you do to reinforce a philosophical notion? So if you think in the Christian tradition, on your knees praying, right? You're, you're literally absorbing a physical movement and then you're praying, which then reinforces all of these theological notions about heaven and afterlife, a God who can grant your wishes. Um, Hinduism has tons of these. Meditation is one, you know, yeah, playing the tabla could be another, like chanting. All of these things are also habitus. And what you were doing in that moment was essentially creating uh, new sensorial experiences that are part, like it's sort of like the intro level into becoming a habit that then creates a philosophy. But I think one of the things, and I wrote this book called The Wedge, which was largely about this, is that you can create, take any sensation and any philosophy, and you can just combine them to create um, essentially placebo effects, as, as you know, use the language that you were talking about. Like we could do, we could have a whole philosophy over stubbing your toe and how stubbing your toe is actually the way to divine grace. And, mm -hmm. and you can create that and people will then associate stubbing their toe with positive outcomes. And then 
in some cases, positive outcomes will actually happen to them. Uh, and that is this beauty of consciousness. Like you, you can fake it till you make it. And then you weren't even really faking it in the first place. So who the hell are we anyway? And, um, I think though, what's really important is to realize the limits of where this is, right? It's to realize that you might be playing this game, but at some point it's still just a game. And there's like this objective reality that actually is there. And, and I found what you said about gurus being stuck in this place. I mean, I've seen this in multiple books that I've written, right? Where we follow a guru and they become cynical. They start fucking their students or there's, you know, extreme financial, basically financial domination of subjects. I think it's kind of like when you're, when you're trying to learn any field, you know, you would actually try to find a teacher that taught something specific in, for some reason, the world of spirituality opens up people who don't have any qualifications to sort of teach you about everything. I remember there was a time I was in India and there was a number of different like swamis at this yoga festival. They were taking um, uh, they were you know taking questions from the audience, and a woman asked these swamis, "Hey, um, I'm thinking about getting divorced. When is it okay to get divorced?" And two of the swamis said, "You know, you should never get divorced. Divorce is bad." And and the last person said, "I'm a celibate monk. I have no, I can't give you any information." And I remember thinking that guy. That guy's cool because that guy is the only person here who's saying, yeah, I have expertise on this stuff. Let's start from there. And then I can also give you more wisdom. But the idea that somebody just innately has wisdom about everything is, is a strange like hole in our logic that we would ever mm -hmm. imagine that that would exist. And I, so I think like if somebody's looking for a teacher, like you could probably find a teacher that taught you one specific thing. And they might have life lessons, but the idea that somebody has everything, you know, the code to life, which I think is a common trend now, that there are a lot of people who on the internet will proclaim to have the answer to more than just one realm of life. I just haven't met too many people who have their shit together in every department. Yeah. You know, like no, filmmaker, <laughs> filmmaker who I admire, their life is a fucking mess. You know, somebody who's really good at investing in real estate they still, you know, they have other problems. Like you can't, you know, somebody who's great at understanding their their physiology or is incredibly flexible or can meditate for 10 hours. I just don't know if they're going to have all the answers in the other realms of life. So it's funny that for some reason there's a big hole in our the way we think where we think somebody could embody all those answers in one person. I think. Yeah, so it's funny. It's like, yeah, the generalized expertise is fascinating. It's like, I wouldn't go to my accountant who is an expert at tax preparation and ask them, should I divorce my wife? Like that is not, I like that. I can give you an accounting reason for a way that it may not be good, but like, I can't tell you these other questions, but you're right. These spiritual leaders do become, um, you know, like in Christianity, we talk about priests and the, the, the moniker is father, right? Oh, father. And the father is essentially the person who's got everything while you're the child. And then, and, and you pass the buck to that, that priest and yet they're celibate. And we know there's problems with the priesthood. Um, well, it's fascinating to like dig in with this, with you, but I, I want to also acknowledge and talk about the other things that you've been doing since Kumari, right? So Kumari came out. And it was a, it was, a, I think it was on Netflix and it was on Apple. I don't know really know where it is right now. Um, but you've gone on to have a pretty successful career in Hollywood as a vice correspondent. Uh, uh, you have a, a, a documentary on the life of um, uh, Barack Obama, several um, pieces on, um, on drug culture. And I got to say that, again, we are our lives like parallel on a lot of these things. What do you think that where do you think? Well, how has your career been like like what what, what sort of opportunities has, has this open for you and where I'm going to ask you also, where is Hollywood going? Well, um, you know, after Kumari came out, it was a different landscape of documentaries back then. Like, you know, we, we didn't have the Netflix originals at that moment. Um, and, 
so Kumari came out in theaters and, you know, it played it, it, uh, I, it played in, you know, uh, IFC theater in New York for like a couple months, but it was a very like all over the place release. And right after that, I, um, I was living in Brooklyn and knew the guys who, who had started vice. And so I, they were, they, I'd seen a pilot for their HBO show and I saw that. And honestly, like, part of what Kumari was, was kind of like an attempt at doing gonzo journalism. And that's what Vice was at that time. And so I saw the trailer and I was like, hey, I'll, like, I'd love to work on this. I did a, I did a couple uh, episodes in the first season and then they asked me to be a correspondent in the second season. And um, it was sort of like the dream job I wanted since I was in my early 20s, like travel the world, you know, it basically be Hunter S. Thompson, but in, in on mm-hmm. film, and um, and you know, I was super into that, and like was one of the great job. You know, I would say my only like full time job really was there. Um, but at some point, as we all saw, it shifted from being Gonzo journalism to being mm-hmm. like you know, sixty minutes uh, for like young people, which is great, but. Um, that sort of gonzo place, that experiential social experiment place that's on the fringes, that's kind of where I, I, I thrive and that's where I was excited. That's where I got excited, you know? Um, and so I, you know, I, I moved away from them sort of after five or six seasons, just because I, the same, the same sort of stories that I was doing after a while, which we go out for a few weeks, not to, with no idea of what we were going to come back home. They started becoming a lot more regimented, probably like the real news, regular news. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, since then I've, you know, been producing and directing uh, mostly documentaries. The, the Barack Obama film was actually a narrative. So it, it had, it had actors playing. It was based on a, a year of Barack Obama's life called Barry when he was called Barry in college. Um, and, uh, and, you know, did a social experiment show called Trigger Warning with the rapper Killer Mike. Um, uh, and uh, I did this thing about this um, social media star rapper named 6 9 uh, that we sold to Hulu. That was my pandemic project. Tried a couple more. Um, <clears throat> tried, to, tried, to, uh, tried to bring back Kumari a little bit just as an exercise. So I did a little thing on uh, a small streamer called Topic. Um but mostly since then, just been directing docu series and documentaries, and uh, yeah, it's been interesting to to see how attention to to films like that have evolved, especially um, how much so much attention has gone to cults. I remember mm-hmm. when Wild Wild Country came out, like my phone was ringing. Like, oh crazy. really? Oh, have you seen this movie? And I was like, uh, yeah. I mean, I, Osho was a Osho was an inspiration, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny when it came out, I had been pitching Osho um, and Osho stories for years and no one ever wanted them uh, in like 2004, 2007. Uh, And I actually went to the Osho ashram in Pune and got invited to an orgy. And I was like, oh my God, this is a crazy thing that's going on here. And the people are doing their Kriyas, which is the sort of like talking in tongues and things like that. And yeah, I never actually ended up writing anything specifically on Osho, but I feel like he is like the template for the Western guru turned almost like mega church star, right? He, he's a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and he's a dress, great dresser. Oh my God. Fantastic dresser, big shoulder pads, crystal mm-hmm. balls. I meditated in front of a, a fleet of Bentleys, I, uh, um, uh, the, which are set up in Pune. Like, Really interesting guy. And actually, honestly, I like his philosophy. When you read it, you're like, oh, it's a radical new way of looking at the world. And a lot of this is like super engaging. And I love how fresh it feels. But I also know how it ended. <laughs> and and yeah. like reconciling those two things is, um, you know, it's impossible. You can't reconcile it. Uh, and you just sort of have to, you know, you can take it as far as you want it, but then you have to leave it at some point or you end up as Sheila or you end up as a, a documentary producer producing something about it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so a- another question, and this is like totally out of left field because you're in Hollywood right now, right? You're in, you're in, you're an LA guy, right? Um, I 
I've been in New York most since making the movie. I just I just uh, moved to out, out to LA to Topanga, so I'm kind of on the outskirts. Okay, but yeah, I'm a Hollywood guy. <laughs> what do you? So here's here's a question that is going around right now. There is a big strike in Hollywood. Okay, yeah. a lot of projects are on hold, and you probably have thirty projects in the works. Is my guess, right? You're 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 a doc guy. You probably have thirty projects. What do you think the writer strike is going to do to the landscape of TV? And streaming. Well, I mean, I think that first of all, I think like what they're what the strike is about is something that had to just was a matter of time it being reckoned with because, um, yeah, I mean the the consolidation, corporate consolidation of Hollywood is is quite terrifying. I mean, just the idea coming from coming from Vice, you know, which you could say all kinds of things about it, but. There was at least a small moment when I was there where I felt like, oh, we could really say something that's, mm-hmm. you know, provocative and challenging and, um, you know, that, that wouldn't be on mainstream media. And um, now all of a sudden you're like, who's going to air that, you know, mm-hmm. when there's only a few ways to see things, um, you know, only really YouTube. So I think it is a little bit like, you know, we all feel it in different ways creatively. And I think right now... Um, it all being shut down um, is making it's, it's really good to know that the entire, you know, community of Hollywood is also like concerned about what the future holds. Um, as far as I think what's going to happen is, you know, I, it's hard for me to say whether it's just going to, you know, contract will get settled and we'll just go back to the norm. I think in the, in the short term, you know, us in the doc space have been waiting for money to be moved into nonfiction um, and it hasn't yeah. happened. I, I've pitched so many docs recently and, and, uh, it's like, you were like, of course you guys should be green lighting all of the best docs ever. And they're like, yeah, no, they just seem to be holding on to their money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that also we went from seeing people went from seeing five documentaries, you know, in their lifetime to seeing five documentaries in a week. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're seeing a lot of things that were, like, you know, a whole new genre of, of true crime and things that fall into sort of highbrow premium documentaries are all kind of entering the landscape. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's, it's just, it's been weird to see how that's, you know, yes, we're watching a lot of documentaries, but some of it is just, you know, recycled versions of VH1 behind the music retold. And, uh, you know, like we're, we, we've kind of re Oh, we're not watching TV. We're watching Netflix. Like we are watching some of the same shit. We're just calling it, you know, it just has a new name. So, mm-hmm. um, I think it's, I think it's still as hard to get out a really good documentary and do something provocative that as it was before, it just seems mm-hmm. like we're all watching more docs. Yeah. So it doesn't feel that way, but I think it's still difficult to do something um, I don't know if the writer strike will actually change that. I think for the short term, it yeah, hopefully some of that money right now will be moved into nonfiction and we can see some new projects. I also think it might, you know, give some life to some more hybrid things in, in, in between. You know, I hope that's the case because, you know, things that are are, you know, um that 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 take the form of unscripted but have narrative elements could also be coming out. But I just don't see too much changing, you know, un, you know, in, in that, like, we're still dealing with five major buyers that right. are big corporations. And I think that's the reality that I don't even know if the strike can really change too much of that. You know? So my prediction for what's going to happen with the writer's strike is I don't know how AI is going to, the, 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 the strike's ostensibly about AI and will AI take our jobs. Um, but I actually, I have this one really amazing prediction that 2025 is going to be like the best year ever for scripted TV (laughs) is that right now, all of these people in scripted are sitting and working on great pitches for great ideas. And we're going to be in a huge lull when stuff doesn't get produced over the next year. But then there's going to be like so many awesome shows and I'm, I'm I'm a little excited for it. I'm a little excited for how things will, will shake out. I think that, I think there's some truth to that. I mean, you're talking about a bunch of really talented people now writing ideas on spec. 
mm-hmm. um, the things that they really wanted to write. So mm-hmm. it's a very good chance that we're going to get some some good stuff in in 2025. So I agree with that. What do you want to write? What is your dream for the? I mean, maybe you can't talk about it, which is fine. Um, because Ari Emanuel is like my number one fan. He's listening right now. So, <laughs> uh, you're saying what am I interested in? Uh, next. What am I doing next? Or, yeah. um, you, well, I mean, I'm doing a number of other of, of doc projects. We just announced one yesterday about I'm doing the Burning Man docu series with Jahan Najim, who did the Vow. So that's happening. Um, look at we're figuring out a buyer for it now but because of burning man was all over the news uh last week um we a lot of burning man. It. were you covered in mud were you there this last week yeah i was there we've been shooting for three years so um it's been an ongoing project and kind of the first time uh people they've allowed people to get access to the organization so that's a pretty fascinating project. It really combines a lot of different things that I've worked on and kind of, it's not a cult uh, movie, but it has a lot of elements of things that are almost like post-cult. You know, everyone's in on the joke over there. Um, and uh, and actually Kumari has also performed at Burning Man too. So, uh, oh, cool. but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're doing that. That's coming out. I'm doing a project with Biggie Sun. That's about like sort of, the son trying to tell, figure out who his father really was sort of behind the, all the hype. Um, and then, and then I have a bunch of other docs. Some of them are kind of in the cult world. Maybe things that we'll talk off, you know, after this about, um, that you might be offline guys. There's about. a whole offline conversation that's going to happen. Yeah. We're big, big released, you know, down the road. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I have a few other things that I'm just working on there. Yeah. You know, I, I can't really talk. It's like, yeah, yeah. Too early, you know what I mean? But no, um, totally. And the funny thing is about Hollywood is I I literally have I think six movie deals in the works, and I predict zero of them will ever get made. But <laughs> you know, there's there's uh, the Hollywood is the, is a dream factory, and the dreams, um, you know, mostly mostly don't happen. So I'm excited to talk to you offline, and I'm sorry, dear listeners, you ain't going to be there. Um, in the meanwhile. Uh, where can people find out more about you uh, if they want to sort of like discover more? Um, really just, I, I mean, I would just say people should probably watch Kumari. It's on Amazon right now or Apple. It's not, um, it's all VOD. So you just have to buy it just like any other movie like that. It's, um, but I think that's a good way to start. Um, and then otherwise, uh, otherwise, yeah, I mean, you just have to, I, I'm, I don't have very much of a social media presence. So, um, so that's going to be hard. I would say start with Kumari. And then if, if that's interesting, um, just go down the rabbit hole, I guess. Look for Kumari. And then remember the guru is in you. <laughs> <laughs>